wrote to Mr. Lord. Evening, heard Mr. Kennedy on Matthew 27, 42. Quote, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Quote, oh, to be more like the meek, forbearing, loving Jesus. Lord, make me more like thee. The meetings and interviews referred to in this journal were a big part of Hudson's work at that time. He was doing everything he could to convince denominational boards and existing mission societies to expand their efforts in China. He explained about the unprecedented opportunities now that foreigners could travel and live in the interior. He described his own experiences and the welcome reception to the gospel he'd found during his years in China. He tried to impress everyone he talked to with the immensity of China, its millions of people, and their need of the gospel. The Christian leaders he met nearly always gave the young missionary a sympathetic hearing, but it soon became evident that none of the boards were willing to assume the incredible challenge of evangelizing a country that contained half the non-Christian population of the entire world. What could he do to stir up greater interest in China? Reverend W. G. Lewis, Hudson's friend and the editor of The Baptist Magazine, asked Hudson to write a series of articles about the work at Ningpo. The first article had already been published when Mr. Lewis returned the second manuscript. He told Hudson that he thought the articles were too important to be limited to publication in his small denominational magazine. Add to them, he urged. Let them cover the whole field and be published as an appeal for inland China. Since Hudson had never forgotten his original calling to inland China, that's what he decided to do. He began studying in detail the spiritual needs of every part of China. While on the field, he wrote, the pressure of claims immediately around me was so great I could not think much of the still greater need further inland and could do nothing to meet it. But detained for some years in England, daily viewing the whole country on the large map in my study, I was as near the vast regions of the interior as the smaller districts in which I had personally labored, and prayer was the only resource by which the burdened heart could obtain any relief. Every day, Hudson looked at the map of China on his wall, read the promises in the open Bible that lay on his desk beneath the map, and prayed. Even as he labored to write a pamphlet, he prayed that he, it would inspire the Christian community of England to launch an unprecedented wave of missionary effort into China. He prayed for every part of his adopted land. Compiling facts about the size and population of every province impressed Hudson all the more with China's needs. At the same time, his research showed him an even more disturbing truth. In recent months, the number of Protestant missionaries to China had actually been reduced from 115 to only 91. Something had to be done. The more he prayed, the more keenly he began to feel that God wanted to use him to answer those prayers. But he was just one person. What could he do? Hudson didn't feel capable of what he now believed God was asking him to do. He wrote, I had a growing conviction that God would have me seek from him the needed workers and go forth with them. But for a long time, unbelief hindered me taking the first step. In the study of that divine word, I learned that to obtain successful workers, not elaborate appeals for help, but first earnest prayers to God to thrust forth laborers, and second, the deepening of the spiritual life of the church, so that men should be unable to stay at home, were what was needed. I saw that the apostles' plan was not to raise ways and means, but to go and do the work, trusting his sure promise, who has said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But how inconsistent unbelief always is. I had no doubt that if I prayed for fellow workers in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they would be given. I had no doubt but that in answer to such prayer, the means for our going forth would be provided, and that the doors would be opened before us in unreached parts of the empire. But I had not then learned to trust God for keeping power and grace for myself, so no wonder I could not trust him to keep others who might be prepared to go with me. I feared that amid the dangers and the difficulties and trials necessarily connected with such work, some comparatively inexperienced Christians might break down and bitterly reproach me for encouraging them to undertake an enterprise for which they were unequal. 
Yet, what was I to do? The sense of blood guiltlessness became more and more intense. Simply because I refused to ask for them, the laborers did not come forward, did not go out to China, and every day tens of thousands in that land were passing into Christless graves. Perishing China so filled my heart and mind that there was no rest by day and little sleep by night till health gave way. I knew God was speaking. Meanwhile, a million a month were dying in that land, dying without God. This was burned into my very soul. For two or three months, the conflict was intense. I scarcely slept night or day, more than an hour at a time, and feared I should lose my reason. Yet I did not give in. To no one could I speak freely, not even to my dear wife. She saw, doubtless, that something was going on, but I felt I must refrain as long as possible from laying upon her a burden so crushing. These souls, and what eternity must mean for every one of them, and what the gospel might do, would do, for all who believed, if we could only take it to them. For seven weeks that spring of 1865, Hudson Taylor made no entries in the journal he'd kept so faithfully. He was too consumed by the spiritual struggle going on in his heart and mind. Summer came. The streets were hot and dusty in East London. Seeing that Hudson was not looking well, an old friend invited him down to the coast to spend a few days at Brighton. Maria, who was concerned about her husband's deteriorating health, encouraged him to go. So it was a Sunday morning in Brighton that Hudson Taylor faced the greatest crises yet in his life. He went to church with friends, but the, sart, the sight of a large Christian congregation who heard the gospel every week only reminded him of the millions dying in China without ever having heard. Too upset to worship that morning, he walked out of the service and wandered out along the sands left by the receding tide. As he walked, he rehashed the inner spiritual struggle that had gone on now for so long. He knew God was speaking to him. He felt confident that if he yielded to God's will and prayed for evangelists to go inland China, God would answer and that the missionaries would go. He believed, too, that God would provide the staggering financial needs for such a venture. Hudson had no doubts about that. One question troubled him. What if they failed? He knew what a new missionaries would have to face, the hardships, the challenges. What if they failed and blamed him? How could he assume that kind of responsibility? Later, Hudson Taylor was able to analyze his struggle. It was just a bringing in of self through unbelief, the devil getting one to feel that while prayer and faith would bring one into the fix, one would have to get out of it as best one might. And I did not see that the power that would give the men and the means would be sufficient to keep them also, even in the far interior of China. But at the time, on that beach in Brighton, he only knew a decision had to be made. He couldn't bear the conflict any longer. Would he accept the burden of leadership he felt God was asking him to lead? He recalled later, In great spiritual agony, I wandered out on the sands alone. Well, the thought came at last, if God gives us a band of men for inland China, and they go, and all die of starvation even, they will only be taken straight to heaven. And if one heathen soul is saved, would it not be well worthwhile? It was then that another thought struck him. If we are obeying the Lord, the responsibility rests with Him, not with us. A great sense of relief flooded over him as he cried, Thou, Lord, Thou shalt have all the burden. At Thy bidding, as Thy servant, I go forward, leaving results to Thee. Of that moment, Hudson later wrote, There the Lord conquered my unbelief, and I surrendered myself to God for this service. Need I say that at once peace, flowed into my burdened heart. Then and there I asked him for twenty-four fellow workers, two for each of the eleven provinces that were without a missionary, and two for Mongolia. And writing the petition on the margin of the Bible I had with me, I turned homeward with a heart enjoying rest, such as it had been a stranger to for months, and with an assurance that the Lord would bless his own work, and that I should share in that blessing. The conflict ended all was peace and joy. I felt as if I could fly up the hill to Mr. Pierce's house, and how I did sleep that night. 
my dear wife thought that Brighton had done wonders for me, and so it had. But that was merely the beginning of an adventure of faith, which was to see bigger trials and greater victories than Hudson Taylor had yet known. 1865 Two days after his decision on the beach at Brighton, Hudson Taylor returned to London where his journal reads, June 27, went with Mr. Pierce to the London County Bank and opened an account for the China Inland Mission, paid in 10 pounds. That was the first reference anywhere to the name of Hudson's new mission, and the money he put in its account was all the money that he and Maria had. They were determined to trust God for their own support. When he returned to London from Brighton, Hudson told Maria about the decision he had made and about the calling he had felt from God. Despite her frail health, her youth, she was still only 28, and the heavy responsibility she had for the daily care of their four, four small children, she accepted her husband's vision as her call as well. She committed her energies also to the seemingly impossible task of evangelizing the vast inland territories of China. More than ever before in their seven and a half years of happy marriage, Maria became Hudson's comfort and inspiration, his constant encourager. She helped with his correspondence and records and prayed with him daily for their work and for the recruitment of the first party of missionaries they hoped to send out. She also collaborated with him on their first and most crucial task at hand, the completion of the publication their editor friend had suggested they write about the spiritual needs of China. About the writing, Hudson said, every sentence was steeped in prayer, and the prayers were answered. The pamphlet, which Hudson titled China's Spiritual Need and Claims, went so fast that it had to be reprinted just three weeks after publication. In the publication, Hudson not only spelled out the needs of China, he reminded the Christian community of their responsibility. Christ's last directive on earth, to go unto all the world, he called for 24 missionaries, and he spelled out the basis of the China Inland Mission, which would guarantee no set salary for its missionaries who would trust God to supply their needs. This faith mission idea seemed radical at a time when the only existing missionary organizations were regular denominational boards. But Hudson's writing was so convincing that his pamphlet moved and inspired countless readers. Inquiries began, became streaming in from men and women interested in going to China. And though he deliberately avoided any appeal for financial support, readers began sending in money to be used in funding the work of the China Inland Mission's first missionaries. The booklet also served as an introduction for the young, unknown Hudson Taylor to Christian leaders and potential supporters all over Britain. An example of the reader's response can be seen in this excerpt from a letter written by Lord Radstock. I have read your pamphlet and have been greatly stirred by it. I trust you may be enabled by the Holy Spirit to speak words which will thrust forth many laborers into the vineyard. Dear brother, enlarge your desires. Ask for a hundred laborers, and the Lord will give them to you. Hudson's prayer, which he recorded in his Bible, was not for one hundred, but twenty-four missionaries for China. And the response to his appeal, while it must have been heartening on one level, added to his personal sense of responsibility. He was well aware that the task before him would prove a greater challenge to his faith than anything he'd yet done in his life. However, it was Hudson's past experience of God's faithfulness that gave him the courage to proceed with his plans and to help inspire others to join in the work. Hudson's treatise told readers how he'd seen God answer prayer before, during storms at sea on his voyage to China, for his safety in China, and for the response of the Chinese people to the gospel. And it was his faith that shone through when he wrote, We have to do with one who is Lord of all power and might, whose arm is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear, with one whose unchanging word directs us to ask and receive, that our joy may be full, to open our mouths wide that he may fill them, and we do well to remember that this gracious God, who has condescended to place his almighty power at the command of believing prayer, looks not lightly on the blood guiltlessness of those who neglect to avail themselves of it for the benefit of the perishing.